meeting. I am Councillor Adam Carter and I am Chair of this committee. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded uh, for publication on the Council's website. Officers attending virtually on Microsoft Teams, please use the raise your hand feature when you wish to speak and Rhiannon will note this down and let me know. Item one, uh, apologies for absence. I would ask Rhiannon. <laughs> So we've had apologies from Sheila Murphy, and that's it. Thank you. Um, item two, the minutes. Uh, I move that the minutes of the Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 17th of January 23 to be approved as the correct record. Yeah. The minutes are approved. Item three, items of urgent business. I have not agreed to any items of urgent business. Item four, declarations of interest. Does any member wish to declare an interest? No. Nope. Moving on to item five, we have the youth cabinet update. Can I ask Molly Quincy to provide an update to the committee, please? Yes. Thank you. So the Youth Cabinet have been recently in our monthly meeting. So at February's monthly meeting, we had our guest speaker from the Essex Wildlife Trust to come speak to us about the Next Door Nature Programme. They spoke to us about how far the Youth Cabinet can support nature's recovery from the biodiversity crisis linked to the current climate emergency. The aim of the project was to provide young people with the advice and support they need to help nature on their doorstep and to leave a lasting natural legacy within their communities. Thorough cabinet, the Thorough Cabinet will be, will be supporting the, ne the Next Door Nature Programme coming up with running their very own nat Next Door Nature project, project in Thorough. So far, we've identified five potential lo project locations within the borough, and at our next monthly meeting, we shall be voting to decide where the project will take place. We will look forward to sharing the location with you for, and further details, of our project in the, further details of our project proposal in the coming months. And at our working group meeting, we continue to write interactive workshops with the Thorax local plan manager. Our chosen problem to explore at this meeting was the uh, late Molly, uh, sorry, um, we're having trouble hearing you a bit. Uh, could you move closer to your mic if possible? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, no problem. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So... At our working group meetings, um, we continued with our interactive workshops with Burke's local plan manager. Our chosen problem was to explore at this meeting was the Lakeside Basin. The format, which is still working in progress, is that we pick a problem in Burke that we think planning could solve. We discuss the challenges and opportunities with a focus considering on how other types of people might view the problem and then come up with potential solutions that the planning team can look to include in the Burke emerging in the emerging plan. We find the work would be quite fun and interesting as we get to, to be creators as we like when exploring a problem, but are also coming up with solutions on how we can improve the area. We feel like our thoughts and views on the future of the borough are being heard, listened to and included in the plans that matter. And we, are, we did, attended the British Youth Council YouthCon event. On Saturday the 18th of February 2023, 11 members of Youth Parliament Youth Cabinet along with two youth workers, travelled up to London to take part in the British Youth Council YouthCon event. It saw over 200 youth pe people come together for a day of discussions, guest speakers, workshop and campaigns all around the youth voice and making it a positive social impact. The event enabled us to develop our, so our skills around public speaking, building our confidence and improving our ability to express ourselves verbally. We also got the opportunity to listen to an inspirational guest speaker who enlightened us on how to grow our self-confidence, fuel a career growth mindset, and master good communication skills. And lastly, the Youth Parliament campaign on the cost of living and health is officially launched. More news to follow this soon. The day was extremely valuable to us. We all felt that we took in a new skill or insight that may help us in our journey, as our journey as a Youth Cabinet members who advocate on behalf of the other young people in our borough. These events are crucial in our development as we can bring back what we have learned in our local areas and begin to take action and to make positive social change. And we have been doing a research project. The Varick Youth Cabinet was recently approached by Tonic, a research company with the opportunity to make them 
preset project. The project was commissioned by Ofcom, which is about understanding about young people's experiences online and content that may promote or glamorise eating disorders, self-harm and suicide. A few members of the youth cabinet have been involved in, with, in the co-design workshop stages of this opportunity to help develop appropriate research tools. The findings and gatherings are being used at, by Ofcom to help to develop policies and guidelines to protect young people from harm online. Youth cabinet members were compelled to have, to, to have a say in this research to aid to the work being done and to safeguard young people online, which they which we share that with you that our newly used youth cabinet online constitutional portal. Please see this link at, at your convenience. The website is now live. We have been linking up with the comments to launch a web page to get our message out there. Our aim is to use the page to keep young people of Fark up to date with the youth cabinet happenings and to create two-way conversation about the things that matter in our borough. We'll share news, photos, interviews with members, send out polls and surveys. We'll encourage young people to get involved in opportunities, let them know what we're working on and take any questions. We're excited to get this going and draw it. And we're excited to get this going, drawing more young people into having a say in things that matter in Thark, which we will help inform and shape the direction of our work. The Youth Cabinet Music Survey, which we have spoken to you about in previous years, is now live. We, previous meetings is now live. We are running this until Thursday the 23rd of March. We politely request that you support us on our mission to encourage as many young people as possible to complete this survey. Please see the link at your convenience. So. So far, 120 young people have taken part in the survey since it went live on Monday the 27th of February. Work on the horizon for the Youth Cabinet. We have been working hard and planning our Youth Wellbeing Day for May half term. Our poster will be released soon for young people to look on to. We are very excited to host the day and promote youth and wellbeing. And the threat to 11 to 25 strategy group. The Youth Cabinet Chair and Vice Chair continue to attend the 11 to 25 strategy meeting to update head teachers on the positive work being achieved within the Youth Cabinet and to share this good news within their schools. And that's all the news from the Youth Cabinet. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you very much, Molly. Um, it's been a really great having you here throughout the year. It's a very consistent part of this committee and your updates are very helpful and very much valued by everyone who sits on this committee. Um, last, last time you spoke about um, trying to recruit more people to Youth Cabinet. Has there been any developments in this area? Am I might cut out. What was the last bit of it? Sorry. Um, uh, where you were looking to uh, recruit some more people to Youth Cabinet, has there been any developments in this area? There has been a few developments and we've got a very good team at the moment on Youth Cabinet and yeah. Yeah, I'm going to step in um, as the lead for the Youth Cabinet. Yeah, we've had uh, two or three new members. Um, they do trickle in. Um, I'm still on a recruitment drive. I do want more representation from a couple of the schools um, and that's on our agenda for my agenda to chase them. Well, we thank the Youth Cabinet for their work in this area. Does any other member have... Councillor Kerrin. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'd just like to echo what the Chair has said about enjoying this. Um, every time uh, we have one of these meetings, um, the Youth Cabinet update is something I look really, uh, really look forward to. Um, and thank you for your work. Um, can I just ask, with the um, Next Door Nature programme, um, obviously, I'm looking forward to further details coming up in next few months. I just wondered generally how it's going, really. It's going really well at the moment. Sorry, my mic cut off really weirdly. Um, we're, we're doing like five potential project locations and we're, we're trying to decide which place we think the project should take place. So we're going to have a vote on that, but we will tell you any further knowledge that will happen with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cockshaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Molly. Uh, again, I'll echo the words of what my uh, colleagues have said. Um, these are really good updates and it's actually quite nice to hear what the Youth Cabinet's doing as a former member. Um, and actually, I'll, where we're talking about a website and, and a 
um, Councillor Carter's brought up about, um, I don't really know where to look, um, we're talk, uh, talking about recruitment. And I always thought very odd, it was very difficult in my time to actually try and get onto the academy if you didn't know someone. It was one of those things, if you knew someone, you could turn up, but even then, the website was at the back end of the Borough Council's own website. And sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, um, sorry, sorry is, is, that, is that better? Yeah, that's yeah, better. Sorry. Um, it, it, it was just where the website, because previously it was so difficult to find information. Um, and if you do actually have your own website now coming along, it'd be really great to actually see. I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to have a proper look through. Um, but I think that may actually be a really good way for recruitment of members, because at the moment, or back in my day, it was, as I was saying, it was you, if you knew someone, you'd get on and you'd just be put on, really. Um, whereas I think if we actually have a website people can go to and visit and find out a lot more information at their own leisure, that was just brilliant. Yes, Michelle. Oh, thank Sorry, you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Molly and Angela, for all the hard work. I guess one of the things I was wondering about, and, and we've considered this for a while, I think, and that is the opportunity for the chair and vice chair to meet the chair and vice chair of ONS. And I think that's something we would want to consider going forward if committee were minded to that. Because I think there's some, some, some learning for our young people about how... how the people that are chair and vice chair got to that position. But also there's incredible learning for the chair and vice chair. So I would strongly recommend to committee that they consider, um, you know, putting in some time to actually meet with the chair and vice chair in the new uh, municipal year. We could, we could actually uh, keep this open to the whole committee. Uh, I don't think we just need to limit it to the chair and vice chair. I'd certainly like to see all my colleagues uh, with me, uh, uh, the youth cabinet, for sure. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I took a look at the... Oh, hi, Molly. Yeah, thanks for the report. Um, I took a look at the uh, youth cabinet site, and, uh, and I was just wondering, were you consulted on the design and able to make decisions and changes to the website to get it to how you wanted it to look? Um, and if no, what would you change? Sorry, I, my computer is really playing up at the moment. Do you care to repeat that? I'm going to say as well, the, the sound quality of the mics is quite poor. Like I'm also struggling to hear it. It regularly breaks up. So I'm sorry if we've missed any statements or questions. Um, it's quite difficult to hear. If you wouldn't mind repeating a bit slowly. <laughs> yes, of course. No problem. I took a look at the, uh, the website uh, and, I, and I was wondering, were you consulted on the design? And were you able to make decisions and changes to the website just to get it how you wanted it to look? And if not, what would you like to change? Changing what? Um, sorry, I just had that. The, it's still quite bad, very sorry. <laughs> um, is it the changes to our website, the one that we've created, or the, uh, which website in uh, the Thorough Council? Uh, you know, your website is the uh, Have My Say site. Um, and I was just wondering if you was actually involved in actually the, the creation of the site, you know, the, the design, etc. Oh, right. Okay. So I, I'll take that one. So the, the the link that is on the report that will take you through to the have your say uh, the Thorough Council portal, um, and within that um, was we've created a, a Thorough Youth Cabinet profile. So um, I liaised with the members on the look of that. Um, obviously, there's set functions within the page, which restricts us, but ultimately, the members confirmed the designs from the design team and put forward ideas um, and what they would like to say in the text, the images that go up, um, all the surveys that are on there, they'll inform um, the questions and what goes out to young people. And Molly, do you feel happy with the content and what that looks like? Yes, I'm very happy with the content being produced and I'm very happy with what it looks like at the moment. I think it looks like a really good pack. Fantastic, thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Panjala. Thank you, Chair. 
first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, and appreciate the Tarak Youth Cabinet, always trying to bring uh, like innovative and new projects for the Tarak Bara. So I am uh, really appreciating about your services. And if you see this next door nature project is really is good, good project. So uh, as per the report, like uh, five different locations we selected. So next coming of coming month, we're going to know that location. So do we have any specific date or month to know that uh, location, five different locations? Sorry, <laughs> I'm, it's, good, it's really annoying. I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. Like it keeps on cutting out. I'm really sorry. So this five different locations, we going to know that up uh, next coming month. So is there any specific date or month we are going to get the details about that five different locations? The f you'd like to know the five locations? Yeah. Um, there's uh, one in South Ockenden. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I believe there's two in two in Grey's area, one in Corringham, and another is, I think the third is Black Shots, or the fifth, sorry, is Black Shots. So what will happen next is um, there's a project proposal that has been written up by the Essex Wildlife. Um, basically, she is the next door neighbour coordinator for that project. Um, and at the last monthly meeting, well, in the meeting that we had in February, she kind of gathered the young people's thoughts on which areas within the borough they felt needed some work. And then she went away and kind of wrote up a project proposal for each of those identified areas. And then at our next monthly meeting, we'll vote on um, the deciding area. And then the aim is to for the youth cabinet to develop this project proposal with the insight to invite other young people within the borough to take part in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does any other member wish to speak? No. Nope. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time today, Molly. You're um, free to stay for the meeting if you wish, but absolutely no pressure as always. And. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to agenda item six, which is the annual report of the cabinet member for children's services presented by councillor Barry Johnson. Thank you, chair. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, I'll endeavor to keep my presentation to as close as five minutes as possible, just to allow more time for members questions. But I would like to say that obviously I'll attempt to answer any policy driven questions here this evening, but I would ask members to have the good grace to allow officers to pick up on any operational points. Otherwise I'd have to take them away in a question and respond in a written format at a later date. So if you could bear that in mind, please members. I would like to give my thanks to the youth cabinet as well and providing their regular updates to this committee. I think they've gone now, but still never mind. I'm particularly pleased with their involvement in the local plan. I think the leader mentioned that last time we was here also. As I've mentioned previously, I believe the portfolio has two distinct parts to its makeup that whilst appearing to sound very different, do work very closely together, and that being education and skills and the children's social care and early help. And despite the vast majority and soon to be all schools in Thorough being an academy or trust, the authority is still very much involved with the school community, providing vital information and assistance in supporting and challenging schools to ensure a positive experience of education for all children and young people. Whilst the authority and schools hold many regular meets, I'm, I'm particularly thankful for the fortnightly meetings with the chief index and school heads, which allows me time to listen and occasionally add to many useful problems or concerns raised by that group around all the local issues. Uh, with Audit Heath School not being able to take the 120 pupils this year, it did propose a potentially challenging prospect for the authority in fulfilling its uh, statutory duty of ensuring all children able, were able to access the Year 7 place. But it is one that I'm thankful to say has been achieved. Well done. <laughs> 
Home to school transport remains a key challenge, one which I assure the members that officers are trying hard to reduce the spend on what is basically a, a demand-led service, so it is very difficult. But I would encourage all members to have a, get a basic understanding of the authority's policy, as that will help you in initial discussions with concerned or inquisitive parents when they, they speak about that subject. The department is preparing for the new SCND and AP Ofsted framework, which has recently been announced. And I'm pleased to say that Thurrock children in general performed in recent examinations, and our SCND and looks after children did particularly well. A new post SCND provision has seen good positive feedback from both parents and young people. And as a final note on the education side, it's comforting to note that Thurrock continues to remain in the top quartile of local authorities with low levels of NEAT. It's imperative that our most, oh, our most valuable children, vulnerable children and young persons receive the same care and attention that we would wish each of our own children and young persons to receive. And sorry to highlight a point again, but we are all corporate parents, so that's something that we must embed right across this authority. With this in mind, it is our duty to ensure children are kept safe and that we respond appropriately to their need. Something we can achieve by making sure our case loads remain manageable, with managers having appropriate control to deliver that safe service. The said service is very likely to be due an Ofsted inspection within the next 12 months, but I'm pleased to state that the service is ambitious and confident that it is providing a good service while striving for outstanding. The department recognises the need to provide early help with which will assist in reducing numbers of children that need to be stepped up to statutory services and or intervention, including the need to be accommodated or with court proceedings. And I'm sure the officers will only be too pleased to expand on the operational side of that work for your information if you need questions. Fostering recruitment and retention, qualified social work recruitment in the context of people leaving the profession, and the high cost of children's placements in the context of providing registered residential placements to meet statutory minimum of providing safe and appropriate placements for children who cannot live with their families, that they're all national issues. And whilst the administration have encouraged the department to undertake all reasonable steps to improve the situation in Thurrock, I'm sure again the officers will be best placed to expand on the operational side of what they're actually trying to put in place for this area of concern. Just two quick further key points to mention here, and that is that our allocation of unaccompanied asylum seeker children has been increased as a percentage of our child population from 0 0.07 to 0 0.10, which in numbers is an increase from 31 to 45 which I'm sure you understand is, of course, is an, ad an additional pressure on sufficiency. But finally, to ensure members that the department is preparing for the implementation of the care review outlined in the government implementation plan. And as we stand at the moment, I'm very happy that we are. We're, 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 in, a, we're in a good place, shall we say. So I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much for your uh, report. I saw Councillor Coxshaw's hand first. It was covered my face, so uh, I couldn't miss it. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I had to. I wanted to labour my point. Um, so I just, when we, I want to roll back to education slightly, um, Councillor Johnson, and really about. I know the, the news today about the Harrier Primary School in Averley and the con concern around the builder going to administration. Are we still on track for that to actually be delivered on time? or is that now being slipped? Um, technically, the, the, as it still says in the report, we, you know, we, we are expecting uh, the September opening, but it, it is in the hands of the, the, the Department uh, of, sorry, of Education, and yes, you are quite correct that the, the builders have um, fallen into some kind of disarray. Um, but I, I personally haven't been told anything else other than it's still on track, but um, I'm afraid that's going to have to be wait and see. Yeah. Uh, no, th uh, thank you. So uh, I know I, I'll speak from personal experience. I know that there's been issue that when projects like this do come forward. Um, working, I saw one in Rochford similarly um, when we've had issues with builders and everything else. Um, but if we're still seemingly on track, I've tr put trust in the DFE to hopefully get that school open as soon as possible.
that, that is my hope too, Councillor. Councillor Kevin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this report, Councillor Johnson. Um, first question uh, just concerns Thurrock Adult Community College. There's um, uh, two paragraphs there um, sort of, uh, stating um, you know, what it does and everything like that. In, in essence, what I'm asking is, now that Thurrock Adult Community College hasn't got um, a, a base because the building's gone, um, would you say that it's, it's currently offering either the same or even more than it offered before when it, was, when it had its base in Richmond Road in terms of number of courses, range of courses, all, all that sort of thing? I don't know whether that's for you or an operational one for officers, but I thought I'd pose it. Thanks, Councillor. Um, actual numbers of the, uh, the courses that there, and I'm, I'm sure that would be more of you know, the officers can answer, but as far as I'm aware, it, it's still offering, if not more, at least the same as what it was before. I, I'm, I'm sure officers can update that and if they wish, if you're happy with that, Councillor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kerrin, for the question. Uh, I think the Adult Community College were very quick off the mark when we went into COVID. They'd already started developing online platforms. They were delivering a lot of their things virtually. And I think uh, with COVID, that, that speeded up, actually. So they were able to offer those courses. Um, we are actively looking for a permanent home. Uh, you know, I'm confident that I'll be able to announce very soon that we've managed to secure a permanent home. I think you're right. I think it is about that presence, isn't it? And it's about them having that permanent home. Um, we've been working hard um, to secure that. Um, I think one of the things about adult education, it's changed over time, of course, because I think historically it would have offered um, some of that leisure type programs. Um, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, the funding is around ensuring that residents have got the right skill set to access employment opportunities. And that's particularly important in Thurrock because of our regeneration agenda. So we're working really hard to make sure that we can support residents to have the right skills to access the uh, job opportunities uh, that are currently available and that we know are coming in the future. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm confident about what they're currently offering. Um, thank you for that. And I think this will probably be directed back to yourself, but maybe Councillor Johnson. Um, in terms of trying to find um, a, a building or a space, um, yeah, I, I fully agree with that because I think um, any sort of academic environment needs that building which has the ethos attached to it. So uh, are you looking for a space that offers the teaching space as well? Or are we talking an admin hub for, the, for lecturers and teachers, or is it an actual space where adults can go and physically participate? So the building that we are looking at will offer teaching space. I think that's absolutely critical. It's not about, you know, clearly we need the admin space, councillor, but we need a place where adults can go in an environment where they think they can learn proactively uh, and, and work on, on their skills development. So, so what we're currently um, looking at, and I'm being very hesitant, I, I sort of don't want to tempt fate, uh, I just want to hold for a little while, um, but we have, um, I believe, secured, um, you know, a, a, a really good option for the adult community college, which will ensure that they can offer that teaching space and they have got that presence because I think that's really important. You know, they've worked really hard around online learning, but they do need a presence. And we were absolutely clear we needed um, teaching space. And I'm very pleased to say Councillor Johnson was absolutely on side with that and was saying, you know, we must make sure that we've got that. So, yeah. Can I just come in? Sorry. I it's in the name. If we haven't got that building that's got the ethos, as you quite rightly say, of, of a, a learning place around it, you couldn't call it a college. No. And that, that, that's, I want it to be still be known as the, the adult college. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, and I know yeah, you don't want to tempt fate, but I'm going to keep pushing you to tempt fate. Um, is there a rough time of when you think you could sit here and say, here's the plan, so we, we, can, we can know? So our aim 
is to start the new academic year in our new premises. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're working towards. Clearly, there's some, some details that we need to sort of iron out as we go through that process, but we're aiming for a September start. I, I was wrong last meeting to interrupt you. Please use all your questions, Councillor Kerry. Well, you said it, so... <laughs> OK. Um, on, on page... Um, bottom of page 26 and the top of 27, there's um, some stuff about the dedicated schools grant, and um, there's a, a sentence in here which I'd sort of like if someone could put my mind at rest, because it said... Um, about the schools forum on options available to reduce demand for EHCPs. Um, is that an active, is that a policy to try and reduce the number of um, EHCPs? Because um, my understanding, I'm happy to be corrected, is that they're, they're issued on a basis of need. So presumably a target to increase them or decrease them wouldn't be right because it should be driven by the actual need. I, I agree. It, driven, driven by need, it, you know, that, that's exactly what they are. So uh, I, I think, I think there, there's, a, there's an underlying is concern in there that you know, are the EHCPs that necessary? Are, are they really necessary? So I think that yeah, if you're looking for any kind of reduction, it's to make sure we have got the right uh, people, sort of young people, going forward with, that, with those EHCPs. I don't know if you want to add to that, Michelle. Or no, I think that's absolutely right, Councillor Johnson. I mean, I think. Many local authorities have seen a sharp increase in requests for EHCPs. And, and we actually, we were expecting that as a result of COVID. Uh, we'd been to committee a few times and said we expected there to be an increase. But I think it's right that we review that. We've got a very clear process. So when a request comes in, uh, a panel make a decision around whether or not it goes to be assessed. And I think that's the right thing, councillor, because what we also have to recognise is that for some of our children, in fact, a vast majority of our children are supported in school on SEND support, and they get some really good access to additional support. So I think it's about always ensuring that we have got those processes in place, recognising that from a school's forum perspective, of course, uh, they manage the finances around that. So actually, it's, it's a conversation they will be having, but we recognise, and I want to reassure committee, any child or young person that needs a plan will have a plan. And I really want to give that reassurance to committee. You know, as I said, I think Councillor Johnson's emphasised that as well. Yeah, thank you, just because um, it, it just sort of rang alarm bells. I'd, I'd hate to think that decisions around this are based purely on budget rather than um, the need of the child. Um, thank you for that. And um, last one for, for now. Um, on page 36, when it's talking about the um, uh, growth and savings, uh, are all the numbers in the, in the boxes, are they all uh, projected... So on, on the, uh, the bit that says growth, um, is that in terms of, is that the actual budget or is it the, um, the savings that are being uh, projected for, for, the, um, for the service? So I'm losing my voice a little bit there. I'll just let you find the page. See, it might just be that I've misread it. <coughs> Sorry, Councillor yeah. Cohen, I'm, I'm not sure of the question. I'm, I'm trying to look at the, yeah, the fit so the data, yeah. Are, they, are these um, numbers here, the, the actual budget, or are they, uh, are they the numbers for the savings that are trying to be um, driven in, in, in the service? So, for example, one for home to school transport, 2223 says 500,000. Is that, a, 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 is that um, a cut or a projected saving to that? Budget or the ho I can see what you're saying. Yeah, the home to school transport budget had some growth put into it to mm. support it. Mm. So that that figure there was some growth that was put in. Yeah. But you'll recognise, Councillor Kerry, that actually, even with that growth, we've seen such a significant uh, increase in demand for um, home to school transport. Um, linked actually not just to um, 
educational healthcare plans, but clearly there's a, there's a correlation there. So we did get some growth put in. I think, as Councillor Johnson said when he was talking about this, um, the team have worked incredibly hard to try and reduce that, but it is a demand-led budget. So it's not the savings, no. Okay, thank you very much. And apologies for the last question, not necessarily being that clear to begin with. Um, and further on, on page 37, with um, home to school uh, transport, I know uh, Councillor Johnson alluded to this when he was actually speaking to his report, but um, what kind... Is, have there been any plans made for, say, how many children are projected to lose their home to school transport based on uh, the need to reduce the budget for it and, um, you know, all the cuts to home to... Is there a, a particular number in mind of children will be affected? No, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a no to the question. That, that, that's, that's not come into the equation. What, this is demand-led again. You know, it, we have a statutory duty to offer home to school transport if we have to. Um, so no, I, I, I don't know how else to put that, no, Councillor. Sorry, I, I, maybe uh, Michelle might be able to elaborate a bit more, but no, definitely not. No, you're absolutely right, Councillor Johnson. It's a statutory duty, Councillor Kerwin. So, so we've got a very clear process. There's a criteria, so uh, parents apply, and if they meet that criteria, then it's a duty on the local authority to provide that transport. So there's, there's, not a, there's not a figure of trying to reduce by X amount of students because it doesn't work like that. Uh, clearly, we do follow the, the policy closely. So, you know, and at times we might get some come through and we actually say no to that particular, um, you know, child. However, there is a very clear process for appeal. And I have to say, actually, recently, Councillor Johnson sat on a couple of appeals. So we've got a very clear process around when we do make decisions not to award transport. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson, for joining us this evening and, and presenting your report. Um, apologies if, if I've missed it, but um, going through the report, I didn't see anything on, on um, Head Start housing um, except its indicative budget for 22-23 and 23-24. Um, are you able to give us a sort of general update on, on how that service is, is going? It's just I recall at the last... Um, uh, portfolio holder um, annual report that was given, I think, at, at council. Um, there was a little section that gave us an update on on that service. So I'm just wondering, is is that is that going all right? Are we, um, you know, I think we ha had at the time 26 properties. Are we are we oversubscribed? Are we? Ha how's it going? So it continues to do really well. We've realigned it, actually, Councillor Anderson. I think we'd always felt that at some point it's a housing project. So we've realigned it into our housing directorate with an incredibly close link to our aftercare service, which is what it was set up to support. So we've got a member of staff in aftercare now that acts as, I call it the bridge actually, uh, across the two services. So it's actually moved over into housing, which was always part of our long-term planning. So I'm sure going forward, uh, it will be something that comes to housing um, sort of overview and scrutiny. However, I'm also sure Janet will bring something back in her main reports around that. It still continues to do really well supporting our, our care leavers with that, that opportunity um, to get them ready to move into their own tenancy. And, you know, it still continues to do really well. Thank you, Michelle. Well, I'm pleased to hear it's, uh, it's still doing really well. Um, other question... Uh, from me, Councillor Johnson, you um, alluded to the uh, additional pressure um, when it comes to unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. Just looking for um, a, a sort of um, uh, idea of what kind of work has been done behind the scenes and, and what process, processes we have in place to ensure that um, we can uh, absorb that additional pressure. Thank you, Councillor. So, for our unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, we know what our number is going to be going forward. Um, we know it's 44, 45. Um, I think they've just adjusted the number in the last week or so, actually, to down to 44. 
Um, we have, um, in terms of our recruitment to foster carers, we're always doing work with our foster carers. So our team manager, we've got an, a team manager who specializes in unaccompanied asylum seekers. Um, he's gone to our foster carers and had conversations with them about what the requirements are, just give them a better understanding of unaccompanied asylum seekers. Uh, the majority of the young people that come into the country and we're looking after are usually aged over 16, so it's making sure that we've got the right provisions for them. Some of them are suitable for a supported accommodation. They may not really need foster care. So it depends on their level, their age, their understanding, what their needs are. Um, we've been able to identify placements for them, um, but of course it's not just placements, it's about education, sort of English as their second language. It's making sure that they get the support they need in terms of religion and just sort of integrating into society, really. So we are really doing a lot of work. Our unaccompanied asylum seeking team is really successful. Um, and, you know, uh, actually this Friday, um, our service manager and team manager for that area is actually doing a presentation to Ofsted. And they've been asked to come along and speak about the good work and some of the really good things we do in Thurrock. We, do, we have things like grab bags. So when young people come, we have... Um, bags which have clothing, toiletries, a whole range of things that they can access services and uh, things that make sure that they feel like they belong as much as we can. Um, we've managed to reduce the amount of um, missing episodes for our unaccompanied asylum seekers by making sure that we do as much as we can to make them feel safe and comfortable. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, if I can just come in there. Uh, just lately in the press, I think you may have read that the... Um, unaccompanied asylum seeker children's missing numbers have dramatically gone up. That hasn't happened here in Thurrock. I, I think we can pride ourselves on that. Oh, that, that is very welcome news, so thank you for that, Councillor Johnson. Um, I have now got Councillor Panjala. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. So, my question to Councillor Barry Johnson, so page number 19, uh, school effectiveness school heading. As per the report shows that uh, 30,000 school children living in Tharaq. So we have 39 primary schools are running and 13 secondary schools and one alternative provision and three special schools that operate across the Warong. So are we running less in capacity of the, th the secondary schools? compared to 39 primary schools we have, but whereas if you see the 13 secondary school. So do you feel, are we running in a less in capacity? Sorry. Yeah, th this, is, this is something that the, the, the team look very closely at on, on yeah, but virtually on a daily basis of predicting numbers and seeing you know, what, what kind of capacity we have got in the system and what we, what we need. Uh, I'm quite confident at this moment in time we are running at the, the, the correct capacity. And when, you know, when the, the obviously, the, the Harrier School, you know, that, that, that is something that does come into our, our reckoning. So it is something we have to keep a close eye on to make sure that, that, you know, that, that scheme does go through. But in answer to your question, in essence, I think we're running at the correct capacity at this present moment in time. I have one more question. Do we have next three years or five years like a, any new prime, uh, secondary schools are we going to introduce in Tharok? Well, as I said, the, the new one in Averley is the one coming out. I think it was at Thames Park has just moved you know, to, to, the, to the new, uh, new area. Mm -hmm. I think we are okay with the moment with the schools that are there. Um, Obviously, we, we, we'll, we're always looking to, as I said, the numbers are, are the, it's, it's a numbers game. We have to make sure we keep ahead of the numbers. And as long as we are keeping ahead of those numbers, then, I, as I said, I think we're in the, the right capacity. Maybe officers might want to elaborate on actual numbers, but I'm, I'm, I think we're okay at the moment. Okay, thank you. I think thank you, I mean, just, I, I think it's probably worth um, recognising that our secondary schools um, have a huge amount more pupils than they do in primary. So, so our primary schools are, are relatively small, but secondary schools are, are quite large. So if that was your concern, councillor, and I can, I can hear what you're saying, you've got 39 of those and only 13 of those, I understand, but actually that's to do with the size, councillor. 
I think, as Councillor Johnson said, this is an incredibly complex area, uh, you know, and clearly we have to be minded of things like the local plan, where there's new housing development. So, so we're, we're, and Councillor Johnson's not wrong, actually. It's something that we're looking at almost on a daily basis because, you know, Thurrock gets an awful lot of people move in, which is fantastic. But, of course, we do need to make sure we've got enough school places. So if that was your question, and I think it was, that's, that's the reason, Councillor. Thank you very much. Do you have any more? No? Uh, I've got um, Councillor Arnold next. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson. Um, yeah, it's good to hear that Thorough is achieving targets above national levels, um, but for those children not meeting age-related expectations in maths, reading and writing, what measures are in place to help? Um, and how is this then monitored regarding their progress and improvement? Obviously, the schools, you know, we'll, we'll do the, the majority of the monitoring and, and they'll report it to us. But as I said, you know, the, the, the schools and the council, are, they're meeting all the time. You know, Michelle is meeting with people all the time. These specific discussions will, you know, will be monitored. Sorry, these specific numbers will be monitored at those discussions. They're, you know, they're, they're probably not something that... I would sit in and discuss about the actual numbers that will be reported to me and I'll ask the question of, you know, why are they up there or why are they down there? Um, so, you know, officers will be looking at that on, on a regular basis. Um, we'd like to have 100% achieving the target. Um, it's, not, it, it, it's not impossible, I suppose, but, you know, Councillor Kerrin's a teacher himself. He can tell you, it, it's, you know, it's not easy. Um, uh, other than that, I, don't, I haven't really got much to add. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Kerry. Thank you. And yes, I agree, Councillor Johnson. It's not easy. So <laughs> it's on the record that I've agreed with you something now. So um, <laughs> just again, this question might just be uh, to clarify. But on page 37, it's got the um, savings table. And am I reading it right that by the end of 24, 25, there's a um, project um, the savings needed of uh, just over four million from the budget for children's services um, and if that is the case um, it's, I think it's quite concerning to lose that amount of money in o over sort of a three-year period so um, what sort of planning is being put in place because that's clearly going to have an impact to have that amount of money um, away from the budget in th in three years so what sort of planning is in place to minimise um, the impact of that? So we've already made some of those savings, Councillor. I think we've come to committee um, probably twice now with some of the savings we've made. Um, we've now got some new savings to make um, over the coming um, sort of two years. Um, we're doing our very best uh, to mitigate where we can but we do have to work within our statutory duties. Um, and, you know, councillors are very aware we're in this section 114 now, which means that actually we do need to work within minimum statutory duties, but we're working hard to minimise, um, you know, what we can do around making sure we're supporting our children and young people. So I think it will be difficult, these decisions like this always are difficult however I think sometimes and and I will pick up the one that I think you'll probably allude to which is about youth and 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 sort of youth service and I think that the duty on the local authority is to ensure that we have got provision it's not actually the local authority's duty to deliver that provision so I'll certainly be working very hard uh, with the wider team to see how that can be secured going forward. So I don't know if that's the one you were thinking about, but I think, you know, as I said, it, it is about what that statutory um, sort of duty is for us. And I'm sure Janet will come in on the social care side. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so in terms of so children's social care, as, um, agreeing with Michelle really that most of our savings have been made in 2022, 23. Those are savings that have already been delivered. We've been really careful to make sure that we continue to deliver good services to children. We've moved from a place of being requires improvement in terms of Ofsted and the services we're delivering to good. 
So where we've embedded services and where we've been able to get funding elsewhere, we're trying to move services around, so sort of trying to, where we've embedded things. So we're really clear, we want to continue to deliver good services, but it's about how can we do things differently while still making sure that children are safeguarded. I'm really clear that I'm passionate about children being safeguarded and that I wouldn't want to be responsible for or managing a service that I thought couldn't do that. So I think what we've done is we've looked at the services and we've said, well, what do we, as Michelle said, what do we need to do to de deliver a statutory minimum? And that can mean a wide range of things. You know, in order to deliver a statutory minimum, we need to have our early se help services in place because that stops things moving up into social care. So the savings that we've identified are not just about cutting services, but actually making sure we're targeting the services in the right areas. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think, uh, uh, good up. thank you both for that. And uh, you both sort of said statutory minimums. And I remember the last um, meeting of this committee, and I think you were there as well, Councillor Johnson, um, we were talking about uh, uh, providing this committee with um, some kind of document outlining what statutory minimum looks like. And I know um, it's all grey areas and things like that, but um, I think I know this is the last one of this municipal year, but um, maybe at the start of the next municipal year, we could sort of really go into that in detail. Shall I take that one, Chair? Um, uh, Councillor Kerrin, that was provided as briefing notes. So we, we provided briefing notes on what the statutory duties were for both education and social care. So um, that information is there. Oh, sorry, no. Um, uh, what, what I meant, in the new municipal year, perhaps we could um, bring it to committee to, so we can actually, yes, have it out in the open, so to speak, because I think with the, um, whatever this, the new makeup of this committee will be post-May, I think it would be, whenever we're talking about statutory minimum, to have it sort of out there as part of the discussion, I think. Uh, apologies, Councillor. No, that's okay. That's, yeah, I've, I've misinterpreted your question. I was thinking, and I was suddenly thinking, I'm I sure hope I you did get that. the briefing. <laughs> 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 that's no, what no, I was just thinking. <laughs> Councillor Johnson was looking at me as to say, I'm sure that was sent. Yeah, no, <laughs> so no it, apologies. it was. Apologies. <laughs> and um, just going forward, I, I really like this format of having the access to the portfolio holder here. So, um, and I think it's a good way going forward to have as many opportunities to directly sort of quiz the portfolio holder at the same time. I 100% agree with that. And I think I said it last time, it, it's such a better format. You as committee members will certainly get the more fuller answer mm -hmm. with having with officers being able to, to contribute as well. Definitely, I Didn't totally agree. Um, yeah, no, no, and uh, I just because of that, I'm, I'm not saying I'm gonna come to every meeting, um, Chair, but I, I, I would certainly, wouldn't mind coming to, you know, more than just of offering a portfolio holder. I mean, it may, may not be me next time, but I would certainly, I enjoy this, and I think it's a good way forward. J just, we just go back to the savings on there. Uh, you, you pointed out, you know, there, there were <coughs> we try to make savings that are, as Michelle said, that they're not going to affect the service. Now, you know, you look at the under education and skills, the two, there's two savings under the cessation of the council providing nursery. An awful lot of work was put into making sure that, you know, that wouldn't have an effect. You got, I mean, the out of hours duty team, I think I'm right in saying that we're not going to lose an out of hours person or persons but you know we can make that saving and that's so that that's the savings we are really looking to try and make yeah thank you very much uh, for those questions um do, does any other member have questions no uh, i'll go on to my own then for now um i i, I know we've we've talked about the savings on page 37 quite a lot but the one i'd like to bring up is the increased uh, number of internal foster carers. It, it obviously, as we, um, as we get more, we have to spend less on sending them out to the borough. I'm sure that's what the budget is saying here, or the savings costs, like the more we recruit, the better we can run the service and cheaper. Uh, but there's no numbers for 23, or tw uh, 23 to 24 or 24 to 25. 
So I was a bit fearful that we're stopping our recruitment campaign or if it's just an unknown as of yet, so it's not put in. Um, look, we're certainly not stopping our recruitment of foster carers, but what we don't want to do is to put something in the report that we're not certain we're going to deliver. So everything that's in there, we're confident we can deliver. We're continuing to recruit foster carers, but also whilst we recruit foster carers, we also, there are foster carers that are retiring, moving on. Um, so we didn't want to put something in there that we couldn't confidently say we're definitely going to be able to deliver on. If we do, that'd be great. Because um, every foster care we recruit is a saving to the local authority. And we are continuing to recruit, but we are also um, losing foster carers at the same time. And so we're making a net, we're kind of at the moment, making a very slight net gain. Uh, you could see it as a slight net gain, or you could see it as we've mitigated quite a big disaster of a lot of retiring at the same time with quite a successful recruitment campaign. I've often said how much I appreciate the work uh, your team has done on this. So that is music to my ears. Thank, Thank you, you for that. I would now like to go to, I believe it's page 27. This was uh, on how social workers in Furrock uh, um, satisfaction amongst the rest of the UK. We were 12th nationally and second in the Eastern region which is really uh, fantastic uh, news. That sounds amazing. Uh, so I was wondering if Barry or Janet could answer me as to um, what is it that sets Farrak apart from our, our area? Why, why, are we, um, why are social workers very satisfied here? Well, I think we challenge ourselves constantly to make sure that we're providing the right environment for social workers in Farrak. Like every local authority across the country, we're struggling with recruitment. That's not particular to Farrock. Um, but we try and make sure that they have manageable caseloads, that they have regular supervision, that there's an opportunity for them to learn and to develop. Um, we really try and make it an environment where people feel able to develop, speak up, have a voice, and feel empowered to do the work they need to do, and to be ambitious about the work we do. Um, within the Eastern region, you know, this is a very strong region in terms of social work. You know, we're one of only two regions in the country that only have, that have no inadequate um, authorities. You know, Thurrock is in a good place. And like I said, we have external review. We have Ofsted coming in and reviewing the work we're doing. And the feedback from Ofsted is that it's a good culture in terms of the way we, you know, managers are visible. You know, managers are there, they work alongside social workers, and it is about making sure that, you know, you've got people supervising the right amount of workers, that you've got people with the right amount of cases, that, that we're consistent in terms of how we manage them. Um, so I think it's all of those things, really. And we had a recent external review, which again confirmed that what they could see was ambitious social workers with supportive managers who were allowed to grow and develop. And I think that's a lot to do with it, really. You know, we kind of... We make sure that our social workers feel safe and that we're looking out for their welfare. Yeah. Thank you. For, yes, Councillor Johnson. Sorry, I was just going to say, I, I did say, point out in the report that I, I think that, that having those, those caseloads is, is paramount, you know, well, manageable caseloads is paramount and having the correct supervisors supervising that to make sure you know, it's right. Cause but it is tough. It's something you've got to keep on top of because it's, it could slip so easily. Because, you know, we, we are talking about a job that, you know, quite frankly, is tough. A very, and, you know, and probably not a job that, you know, we would all stand up and say, yes, we'd love to do that. I, I, you know, I can put my hand up and say I, I find it extremely tough to do. So, you know, managing caseloads, having the correct management or supervision in place is paramount. But... It has to be kept on daily because it, it could easily slip. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor Johnson, and thank you very much, Janet. It was a very welcome addition. Uh, does any other member wish to speak on this item? Uh, well, thank you very much, Councillor Johnson, for presenting your report. Um, we will now turn to... and I'm, I'm, 
don't know if I will be chair next year, in the next municipal year, but you will be invited back uh, a few, few more times because we've definitely enjoyed having you here. <laughs> so with that, we move to agenda item eight, which, seven, seven I, I do apologize, agenda item seven, which is stable homes built on love, government implementation strategy and consultation on children's social care reform, uh, 2023, found on pages 39 to 44 of the agenda. It's, it's quite a long title, yes. <laughs> Can I ask um, Janet Simon to introduce the report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, in June 2022, a report was presented to Overview and Scrutiny on Josh McAllister's care review of children's social care and the National Safeguarding Panel Review of Child Protection following the death of Arthur Love. Labinjo Hughes and Star Hobson, um, which identified a set of chronic challenges that, that get in the way of child protection and work. And these relate to practice and practice knowledge, system processes, leadership and culture, and wider service context. The care review is presented as a once in a generation opportunity for radical change in children's social care. And there were 80 recommendations which would require an investment of 2.6 billion over, the, over a five year program. The, this report to committee is about the government response to the reviews on the, on the 2nd of February, which, as you said, is a very long title, Stable Homes Built on Love. Um, and they uh, developed an implementation strategy plan and consultations are going on through, uh, through right through to the 11th of May this year. The government implementation plan is a response to the recommendations my, made by three independent reviews. So the Josh McAllister um, review, the Child Safeguarding Practice Review Panel into the tra Tragic Murders of Arthur and Star, and the Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA Review of the Children's Placements Market, uh, which looked at and revealed the current children's care system is often fragmented, there's some silos, and struggling to meet the needs of children and families across, across England. So what those re um, reviews found, that vulnerable children would be better supported to stay with their families in safe and loving homes, something that we find we're always, we're always trying and striving to do is to keep children within their families, um, cared for by their families wherever we can. So this is backed by 200 million over the next two years and a new and wide ranging children's social care implementation strategy, which will transform the current care system to focus on more early support to children. In introducing the consultation document, the Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing said children in care deserve the same love and stability as everyone else. Our, right way, our, our wide ranging reforms will put strong relationships at the heart of, children, of the care system, from supporting our brilliant foster carers, kinship carers and social workers to getting help to families and improving children's homes. We want every child to get the support and protection they need. So, within the report, um, the government um, set out four, six pillars. And so, the six pillars are listed in the documents, and I won't go through all the detail there, but essentially, the pillars um, one to six include, the first one, pillar one, is to provide the right support at the right time, so that children thrive within their families and that families stay together. So, that's in summary, pillar one. Pillar two is a decisive multi-agency child protection system with agencies working together in a fully integrated way, led by social workers with specialist expertise and knowledge. Pillar three is to unlock the potential of kinship care. So wherever possible, children who can't stay with their parents are cared for by people who know and love them already. Uh, pillar five, which is a reform, reform of the care system to make sure we have the right homes for children in the right places, to be ambitious for children in care and care leavers, providing the right support to help them thrive and achieve their potential through to adulthood. Uh, pillar five, which is to provide a valued, supported and highly skilled social worker for every child who needs one. And lastly, pillar six, to make sure the whole system continuously learns and improves and makes better use of evidence and data so in, in summary, it's, it's positive 
um, that there's a clear direction of travel following last year's review. The government strategy and impl implementation document points to a range of consultations over the coming year and a period of pathfinding and pilot activity. And this is important for medium to long term change. There will be an opportunity for debate and review over the coming months during the consultation period, and there'll be significant changes in how services are delivered to and with vulnerable children and families going forward for the next generation. The committee will need updating um, when the pilots have started operating and at the point phase two of the reforms are being proposed. That's in summary the report. Thank you very much for your report, Janet. Um, I'd just uh, briefly like to remind everyone here just to speak very clearly into your microphone as there has been some difficulties um, for the recording. Um, but, but first, uh, thank you again for the report. It's uh, very welcome. It, it certainly uh, goes to show how quick time flies when the, at the start of this municipal year we were talking about um, what those recommendations might be and then the government um, has brought, brought them out. Um, I would now like to open the floor to questions. I see Councillor Arnold's hand go up first. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, just going back to page 41, and it's the, uh, the six pillars. At pillar one, do you know which of the 12 local authorities that will gain the focus, will gain focus in, in pillar one? Sorry, say that again. I missed. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't say that wrong. Do you know yet which 12 local authorities will gain focus in Pillar 1? Pillar 1. Okay, so that's the right, um, around providing the right support at the right time. Um, so in terms of um, local, local early help and intervention um, with challenges around addiction, domestic abuse and mental health. So Thurrock um, is one of so one of 75 local authorities that have gained funding in terms of early help and start for life. Um, but in terms of the 12 local authorities, um, we haven't really got all the details yet, but for some of them, we know where they are. So we know, for example, um, when it comes to the fostering, um, one around fostering, that's most of the authorities are in the north rather than in this area of the, of the, of the country. But no, I'm not clear about exactly who is getting that funding at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Councillor Kevin. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for talking us through the pillars. Um, just looking on it from the outside as a, as a corporate parent, I suppose, and not as um, sort of an officer with your level of knowledge, but it seems to me that trying to intervene at the earliest possible level and um, to support families seems like the way forward. Um, this question is, a, I suppose, a bit of a follow-on from... Uh, Councillor Arnold's because um, those 12 local authorities um, will be sharing 45 million between them to implement the pilot so if that is you know just under 4 million or so each is that the sort of funding we can expect in Thurrock for when for when we try and implement this one, once all the pilots are gone and um, it's rolled out is that the sort of funding that local authorities can sort of look to to try and implement this this new strategy i hope so <laughs> um, i don't know is the answer um it, at the moment they are pilots and they want to see whether or not these things work as well before they'll be able to commit to whether or not this will be something that's ongoing um, so for example you've talked about early help and how important that is we're really clear that early help is the foundation on which we work that if we can keep children at home, if we can keep them safe, um, that is absolutely the best outcome for them. Because, you know, when children come into care, you know, they reach adulthood, um, you know, we are their corporate parents and we try to do the best for them, but, you know, we all need somebody we can turn to when we're adults as well as when we're, we're young. And so if we can keep children with their families, because often children will return to their families, they will find a way back because it's, it's their family. And so we try and make sure that children can stay where they are. So, as I said, Thurrock is one of 75 local authorities that gained funding through the Start for Life family hubs. And we are, um, so we're getting, I think it's about three million over three years. And we've really worked well with our colleagues in education, in our with our health colleagues, 
to make sure that we're really kind of developing that early help offer to our young people. So I don't know is what I could say. There's pilots. It doesn't mean we can't put ourselves forwards for that, but we need to have more information really about what that will look like. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. And obviously, um, we all want lots of money to try and for, for our local authority. Just with your sort of past experiences of when new schemes and initiatives have been brought in, um, they, I presume they tend to bring in funding to be able to, to allow the local authority to implement it. Um, would that any money that we got to try and uh, help us implement this new program, would that be safe from all the savings and cuts and things that we're hearing about because of the current financial situation? So the funding that we're receiving um, for the Family Hub, Start for Life, that funding is ring-fenced. We have to, so we've had to do business cases. It's not simply a case of them saying, here's the money, go off. We've had to be really clear about how we're going to deliver the services, how we're going to spend the money. We have to do regular reports, which updates the DFB in terms of what we've spent that money on and what difference it's going to make. If we don't spend the money on the services that we say we're going to spend it on, they'll take it back from us. So it is ring-fenced. Thank you. And just uh, one last one. Um, on page 43, it says about um, committee will need updating when the pilots have started operating and at the point phase two of the reforms are being proposed. Do you have um, a rough idea of when uh, these milestones will be reached so that we can sort of look forward to it coming to this committee for sort of full report and a, a real debate on how it goes forward? So at the moment, um, as it's kind of just say further down in the report in terms of the legal implications is that um, the council will respond to any changes and guidance. At present, the timetable for proposals on legislation reform is set for autumn. So I would expect to bring something back at the end of the year to be really clear about this is where we are, this is what we're participating in, and this is what it means. If, if you're still chair then, councillor, if we could have that at the end of the year, that would be, that would be fantastic. I'm sure Janet would make us anyway. <laughs> Uh, does any other member wish to speak? Councillor Panjala. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page number 42, pillar number 5. Uh, I would like to know about this one. Like, uh, Local authorities will be supported to recruit up to 500 new child and family social worker apprentices. Is this for uh, Tharak one, Tharak district, or uh, this number? across the country, so. I mean, there's been, in the last week, we've put ourselves forward, expressed an interest in terms of being part of some of the work around social work apprenticeships. They, they're really successful. We've had some social work apprentices in Thurrock um, over the last few years, and we've recently just, um, they've just recently completed their training, and they're now employed by the local authority. So yes, I think it's a way forward for some people who think, I can't just go off and do my training, I need to earn as well and I need to manage. So I think it can be a really good way of promoting social work. Whether it's realistic that they'll get 500, I don't know. Um, but we're working really hard to make sure we get social workers through apprenticeships, through the step up to social work, to find different ways, innovative ways to get social workers into Thurrock. Thank you. And one more thing. Uh, currently, how many agency social workers are working in Tharok district? Um, in children's social care, um, mm -hmm. I think we have around 40, 41 agency social workers. Mm -hmm. So once we, uh, so this find it belongs to comes under children care or uh, like uh, this new recruitment, like uh, we're going to find it in numbers? Well, I think in terms of the government implementation, I think that the idea is, is that we would have less agency social workers. Our aim is always to have permanent social workers in Thurrock. A, they're cheaper. B, it means more consistency for young people, for families, not having to tell their story over and over and kind of knowing who their social worker is going to be. People will always leave. That's the nature. People will go for different jobs and move on. But wherever possible, we want permanent social workers who are committed to Thurrock and committed to the children of Thurrock. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for um, presenting the report, um, Janet. The, on the first page, um, as you mentioned, um, the care review um, was presented as, as a once-in-a-generation opportunity for radical change and set out over 80 recommendations that would require 2.6 billion. Um, this, this response to that review um, says that it's, it's been backed by 200 million over two years. Um, so is that, is that all that's been um, allocated so far? What, what was the, the response to the, the suggestion um, for, for 2.6 billion of investment? This is what's been identified so far, but as it, is, as it states clearly, we're in the first stages of it. So some things have been committed so far, but there will be further commitments going forward, is my understanding. So consultation's open. It's important that members, you know, mean we need to make sure we're sharing that with you so that you're really clear about that consultation process. And we need to be feeding into that, really, and making sure we're having our voices heard about the funding. So, for example... One of, the, one of the funding streams is around, um, we've been told that you know, we need to increase the amount we pay to foster carers. Um, most local authorities are probably already paying at the rates that are being asked for. But if we're going to increase it, where's that money coming from? So we've been told that some of that's from the social care fund. Well, that's money that comes into the authority already. So to me, that's not additional funding. So we need to be really clear about what do they mean by additional um, and, and how is that going to be funded? The care leaving allowance has gone from 2,000 to 3,000. How is that going to be funded? Is that coming out of the social care funds or is, is, there, is it additional money that's coming in? So we need to be clearer about some of those things. Thank you very much. Uh, following on from that, on uh, number 2.4, uh, page 42, uh, it says uh, foster carers will also see an above inflation increase in their allowance help. I don't know if you just said foster carers or kin uh, kinship carers, so I don't know if I'm asking you to just repeat yourself, but do we know where the money is coming from for that? Is that from government? I think, you know, that's one of the questions. I think what's been said at the moment, so in the information that came through um, from uh, the government, which was this is what you need to increase by, we were told it was coming from the social care fund. So, to me, I'm not sure that's more money, but we just need to be really clear about that. So, we're not talking huge amounts, but what, what we've done is we've done some, our finance have gone through those figures. We've compared ourselves, because it depends on what region you're in, what region you consider yourself in. Thurrock is in one of those unique positions. So we're part of the Eastern region, but we're very close to London. So we need to be competitive with some of those authorities that lie very close to us. Um, but actually, we tend to pay very near the numbers they're saying we need to pay out anyway. So it's not going to have a huge impact for us, but we know that we need to think about what we pay foster carers, make sure that they're adequately rewarded, and make sure that we're competitive. Um, but again, like I said, we need to be clear, where is this money coming from? Is it something additional? Are they giving additional money into the social care fund to allow for that? Because that's not absolutely clear. Thank you very much for that. Um, does any other member wish to speak? No. Nope. If we could turn to the recommendations then on page 40. Uh, recommendation 1.1, that the Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the contents of the government's implementation strategy for reforms to children's social care and the potential impact these will have on service delivery over the next few years. Are these noted? Okay. I, see, I see nods. <laughs> that, um, thank you. Uh, 1.2, that the Overview and Scrutiny Committee note the implementation strategy is open for consultation until the 11th of May 2023. Thank you. Uh, with that, we move on to agenda item eight, which is uh, Thurrock's Child Care Sufficiency Annual Assessments uh, 2022, found on page 45 to 50 of the agenda. Now, there was a, um, a 
something missing from the report, but this has been circulated online and we gave out a hard copy to anyone who wanted to read it. I believe Councillor Kerrin and Councillor Arnold have one at the minute. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would like um, Michelle Lucas to, uh, to um, introduce the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to actually ask one of my staff to introduce this report. So I'm going to ask Andrea Winstone to introduce it. it. Yes, that is on the report. Sorry, I read the line underneath. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is... Um, this report has come back to you because you were asked you asked in November I believe for some further information around what the teams were doing to support the childcare settings in Thurrock so you'll see the paper the paper that comes with the report is listed them in um, brief detail and then in the report itself they've gone into the officers have put into greater detail the support they provide to um, the providers and that will be found on pages 8 to 16 so that's the, the new bit that you asked for additional information for um, what I will say is that um, we work really hard with, the, with our local settings and we've got a very good relationship with all of them and they um, are very grateful of the help that we provide and, and we have lots of positive feedback from the providers in the local authority. Um, we support them in setting up new their new business and, and you'll see in um, the between pages 8 and 16 the sorts of work we, we do with the, so the child care sufficiency officer is the officer that writes this report and she's listed all of the activities that the whole team do um, what I would say is um, Michelle and I take a keen interest in early years it, it's it's um, as you're aware the best place for, for children in early years is to have a really good start so we um, we took it upon ourselves as well to, to request a meeting with the DFE early years branch um, to talk with them around our concerns around some of the things you've raised as concerns the settings closing and the reasons for those settings closing and that, that some of that comes down to funding and the, and the rates of funding so we were we did meet with them um, last month I think it was wasn't it to to have a conversation um, and they were, they were open, weren't they? They were open to the conversation. They, they, it was going to go back to the Secretary of State. It was going to go back to the Ministers. So we're, we're pleased that they're open to, to listening to our concerns. Um, one of the things I would like to show you that, that is in the report, it's in, on page... Um, sorry, I should have found this before. Um, on page 11... I don't know what page it is on your report. It's on page 11 of my report. Um, where we've explained that the schools were um, awarded a 5% up shift in their nursery payments to cover the cost of the uh, salaries increase. And what the schools decided to do, because it wasn't made equitable with the early years settings, was to share that across the whole of the early years sector in Thurrock. So schools are also supporting our early years services. Um, they didn't have to do it, did they? But at Schools Forum, uh, the... the the opportunity was presented to them and they took it and, and, and that was really well accepted and the, the settings are grateful for it. I don't want to go through in great detail all of the activity that we're doing because I think it would take all night because we do ever such a lot. Um, but I just wonder if there's any questions you want specifically answered. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that the, this report was embedded in the paper so you didn't get it in, in the right format. I apologise for that. That's quite all right. It, it was available online, and like I say, we did notice it beforehand, so some hard copies were provided. Um, uh, so I will open the floor to questions. Uh, so, um, I, I thought Ke Councillor Kerrin would have his hands up straight away. So, <laughs> Councillor Kerrin. Um, thank you for this report, and thank you also for listening to previous um, things that have been said in this committee and for going away and coming back with... Um, you know, further updates and everything. It's really, I think it's really important that, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, yet, I mean, I've had, I obviously had a glance through it at this meeting because um, I got a hard copy of it here, so I haven't um, been able to go through it in the same detail. I have the rest of the report, but um, just generally, um, the big thing that we noticed in the last meeting was obviously which wards had gaps in childcare places and things like that. So apologies if it's in the, uh, the report but I haven't read it yet um, 
are any of the wards now beginning to reach the point where um, their place needs are being met and uh, are any of the numbers moving in the right direction in terms of um, childcare sufficiency? Absolutely. So we, we, we work with any um, new provider that is registered with Ofsted to open and we help them to look for new, new premises. Um, so we work with Sarah's team to make sure that when there are, um, or well, it's actually the, people, the place planning, isn't it? To make sure when there are developments and Section 106 money is available that we, we put the, our, our hat in the ring for some of that money to, to support providers to open as well. We have business support for all new providers. Um, so we've got uh, approximately four or five providers at the moment going through the opening up process. Um, we encourage them to open where we want them to open, but we can't make them. So we, 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 th the purpose of this report is not just to um, inform elected members and the council, it's also to inform providers where they might think about opening a business because there's lack of places available in that, in that area. And that's what, where we work with our child care sufficiency officer. We'll work with those providers and to help to find appropriate premises um, that would meet the offset requirements. Th yeah, thank you for that. And um, obviously, the, you know, recently there was the, the example of the Tilbury Nursery that closed. And I know that in the previous meeting, um, I was assured that all the children there did end up receiving uh, their childcare entitlement but on the report it still says that there's a, a, um, a gap of places in both Tilbury St Chad's and Tilbury Riverside so um, can you just explain how those two marry up that the children affected by the closure of the nursery got their places but there is still a gap in those in the two wards of Tilbury case. I, I think I should um, refer back to this report the, the numbers in the report were written back uh, late summer. So we're starting to write the report again for this year now. We're just getting the figures together now. So they wouldn't, they, the schools in the area, so we've got three or four schools in the Tilbury, St Chad's area that have opened their nurses or expanded their nurses to take those children on. So that will be reflected in the new report, the new child care sufficiency assessment. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any more questions, Councillor Kim? No. no? no okay. Uh, uh, Michelle. Sorry, if I, if I may. Uh, I think one of the things, um, Andrea talked a little bit about it, but I think this is really goes to the heart of the relationship we have with schools. Because I think when we met with the Department of Education, they were really somewhat surprised that our schools had made the decision to share that 5% with the whole of the early years sector. I think they actually want to come and speak to us about that because they said, oh, that's, that's quite unique. And I think it really does strike at the heart of the work we do in partnership with our schools and schools recognising the absolute importance of that, that early years offer because actually it's around school readiness isn't it you know we would have used uh, the term councillor Cohen wouldn't we school readiness and that's so important so I think you know I'm, I'm really pleased that when we met with the department a they were very open to what we were saying they recognised it was a challenge. I think there's lots and that's lots of information in the press at the minute. Don't quite know what the budget's going to say, but we know there's going to be something in there around this early years sector. So I think I just wanted to emphasise that actually, because I think you know it, I'm really proud of Thurrock Schools. They did not have to make that decision. They could have kept that money, uh, you know, for their school nurseries, but they really recognised the importance of the whole sector. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, there was recently a, a, a quite a story locally in, in my own ward of Chapel St Mary and I was wondering if that affects anything in this report because obviously that has had to now w withdraw itself. Is that about the nursery closure? I'm sorry, what was the question? About oh, it was a, the, um, the case quite recently where some children got out. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so... That was reported to us on the day it happened, and it was also reported to Ofsted and the police by the parents. Um, we quickly um, also, we worked with the setting straight away to make sure, so the setting was closed by Ofsted on that day. 
So the minute that they reported it to Ofsted, Ofsted closed the setting, and they'll be do it. They're, they're closed for the duration of the investigation that, that, um, that Ofsted undertake. We have supported the parents. So I've, I've written personally to both and spoken on the phone to both parents, and we've sent a letter to both parents about other childcare providers when they're ready, when they feel confident enough to, to put their children in a, with another provider. The, the, there is some confusion about exactly what happened. Um, it's believed that one little girl rolled under the fence and a, a little boy followed her, um, and then they went their separate ways and were, and were picked up by separate adults that returned them to the nursery. Um, the investigation is still ongoing around the exact details, so I, I can't share those at the moment. But both children are safe. Uh, both parents were quite traumatised, as you can imagine. Um, we have supported all of the parents with where they can find other childcare providers for the children, the remaining children in the nursery. So the, the nursery had about 30 children that used it at any one time. So those parents were written to as well. The nursery funding will move with the child, so the nursery stops stop getting paid on that date um, for the funded places, and those places will will um, be funded whenever the, the parents choose to take up a new nursery place. Uh, the provider has resigned uh, her post as, as nursery manager and owner, so she will not run the nursery anymore. That's her decision. I think it's it's upset her as well. So I don't know if you had any more questions. Uh, I, I understand the delicacies that you've probably just said about as much as you can say at this time and I, I think the committee really appreciates the um, sensitivities around this topic but I've found a lot of what you've said very reassuring so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, is there any other member wish to speak? No? Okay, um, so if we can go to the recommendations pound, found on page 46. Uh, that is 1.1, that the Children's Overview and Scrutiny uh, Committee review the requested additional report relating to the annual child care sufficiency assessment 2022 and offer any additional comment and feedback. So I believe we've done that. So thank you for that. And thank you for, uh, I'd like to echo the words of Councillor Kerry and uh, others that um, it, we're really grateful that this has been brought back when requested. So thank you for that. Okay, we now move to agenda item nine. I would like to tell members this is also due at cabinet tomorrow. I will be providing a, a verbal update on this committee's behalf uh, once we have discussed, obviously after we have discussed it. Uh, if I could um, ask Councillor Barry Johnson, so it says report of Councillor Barry Johnson. Are you reporting it? Are you introducing it? Okay, is it case on here? So, um, sorry, is it Michelle? Thank, is, are you, are thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, yeah. I'll be presenting the report, Sarah Williams. Thank you. So, this report. <laughs> so, this report is uh, for the school capital program for 22-23, and we'll provide an update. Um, it's based on we put the capital program together based on pupil place planning. So, we do an annual pupil place plan on an annual basis that's presented to um, overview and scrutiny actually yearly um, so this is to ensure that we have enough statutory places we have statutory duty to provide those places for the, this end of last year and this coming academic year we will be looking to cabinet tomorrow actually the report will be presented there where we will look for approval to appoint an architect-led design team as well as a principal contractor for the expansion of Tilbury Pioneer Academy, which is currently a two-form entry primary. So we will look to expand it by one form entry to three forms, um, providing an additional 210 places. Uh, we've already um, undertaken design feasibility studies and had different options um, and at the time of writing this report, we were looking at um, an estimated um, value project of three million. Um, that includes all the architect fees and um, other disbursements and contractor. Um, members should note that the, the uh, funding for this project is grant funded from basic needs, so not from um, revenue. 
So funding is already available from our basic need, which is uh, provided by this font for education for people places and allows us to meet our statutory duties. Um, demand for places has increased. Um, over the last few years, we've seen large increases in in-year admissions. That's an area that we look at on a monthly basis. We look at, when we talk about pupil place planning, we monitor that monthly. Um, and we do that um, with a number of colleagues in, within the team. So we also consider transport, all sorts of things that we look at in terms of our pupil places and where we might need to put bold classes. So some of the work that we've already done uh, this year is around um, the AV Oppenden area. So we had to put a bold class of additional 30 places in there. We're still looking at other additional places in the central area, as well as some of the work that we've done in partnership with secondary schools. So I have to say for sep se September uh, this year for year seven places. So we've put lots of additional capacity in and still currently reviewing what that might look like going forward. In terms of the Tilbury um, Pioneer expansion, you know, we're looking at that, and we have been looking at that for some time and monitoring that. We have got, you know, a, not enough places in a number of year groups, so from year one to year, current year five. In terms of reception places across all planning areas, actually we're seeing a bit of a decline in birth rates. So reception isn't necessarily a big issue at the moment, but, you know, we have to account for what comes in in year. And so pupil, when we do our pupil place planning, that we look at birth data for that, but what we aren't able to do is then um, plan for what happens. You know, we can't plan in advance for what happens as we, we go through each year. So I think I've probably talked quite a bit about what we're doing in, um, uh, in Tilbury Pioneer and what the plan is for there and the budget. In terms of Abbot, Abbott's Hall, so we did a, a small expansion there where we expanded them by half of a form of entry. So just to make them a full two forms of entry so that they could um, take additional children for us. That project is now, I'm pleased to say, due to complete and handing over this month and has made a real difference to that school, actually. So we've done quite a bit of significant work there and given them additional classrooms. We've already talked about some of the in-year challenges and some of the in-year works that we do need to do. Um, and you know, one of the other schools that we'll be looking at is uh, Summers Heath. So we'll be looking at a year two class and any further ex expansions or um, bold classes that we might need as we go forward. And obviously we'll be considering what comes along with the local plan and future developing schools and expanding um, and new schools as that local plan develops. Thank you. Thank you very much for your report there. Uh, does any member wish to speak? Councillor Anderson. Um, not, not really so much um, a question, um, but just to comment and, and thank you for the um, approximate costing um, appendix um, for the uh, Tilbury Pioneer uh, Academy. Um, obviously, we've, we've had issues with other projects at, at Council in the past and, and costings and, and being able to scrutinise that. Um, and going into um, this detail, you know, we've got six and a half thousand here to replace PVC windows. This, to me, just um, means that we'll be able to, uh, down the line, um, scrutinise more easily and effectively if, if um, any issues do arise, which I hope they don't. Um, so just, just thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, Councillor Cockshaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going quickly back to the in-year accommodation works. Um, it mentioned DILPS. So is, is, is both Summers Heath and DILPS having work done? Um, I know there's a bit of confusion there. And then just as well, specifically with DILPS, is, has the project completed? Because it says February this year. Yeah, so at the time of writing this report, we were already um, expanding, uh, not expanding, uh, putting in bulge classes. So we were doing some internal works for DILPS. That was for year one, but we also need to put additional places in year two in the AV Ockenden area, which is why we are looking at Summers Heath for those works. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Does any other member wish to speak? Councillor Kerrin. 
Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the report. And it's, uh, it's very good to see sort of something happening as a result of pupil, pla uh, pupil placement data and, you know, avoiding any issues around shortages of places. Um, my questions um, are more to do with the recommendations more than anything. So um, the first recommendation seems like a standard um, one for an ONS committee, you know, um, to recommend decisions and, and all that. But then from then on, it goes into approving. And is that wording that's more for cabinet? Is it cabinet that approves the commencement of the works and everything because um, I, I didn't see it as an overview and scrutiny function to approve the works but more to comment and to give opinion and I think it's 1.1 uh, and the recommendations that are following 1.1 is saying these are the ones we are recommending go to cabinet as the, the ones underneath uh, so would we only be voting on 1.1 then that we that the report then goes to to recommend it going to cabinet. Sorry, was it? If you read it number one in context, we recommend the following decisions to cabinet. So it's just whether, I don't know, we should be approved, whether you agree with those recommendations. Maybe we agree with cabinet recommendations. Well, or we agree to recommend these decisions, uh, these are, uh, uh, we consider to recommend the following decisions to cabinet. Okay. and. Okay, um, thanks for that. And the, the only one I sort of um, would like a bit of reassurance on, I suppose, is 1.4. And it might just be the wording, but I'm just mindful of um, sort of recent events around in the council and sort of openness and where it says that authority be delegated to the Director of Children's Services in consultation with the relevant portfolio holder to enter into any form of agreement. Um, does are there any sort of um, provisions in place for um, either the, the director or the portfolio holder to report back on um, the financial implications or um, anything where either cabinet or overview and scrutiny get to have another look because it, it looks like we're just saying to um, the director of children's services and the portfolio holder to sort of get on with it and um, I'm not sure whether whether that sort of sits right because of you know what we've what we've learned in recent times about decision making being you know closed into a small number of people I, I, I just sort of throwing it out there I, I mean I, I can see your point most definitely um, maybe report back we report back here with any major changes in that in this proposal, but I, I think I'd, I'd be quite happy putting that towards cabinet. Yeah, because I don't think we should be telling you how to do your job or, or telling cabinet what to do because cabinet is there for its reason. But it's just, I just think I'd be more of a responsible member of this committee if I was sort of trying to throw a bit more light on what happens once once we hand over to the director and, and the portfolio holder. I, I'm quite happy to add another recommendation that this comes back to scrutiny committee if um, that's what you're after, Councillor Kerry. Yeah, yeah, I think so, because um, I want to get that balance right between recognising that we're an overview and scrutiny committee, we're not an executive committee, but I just would like to feel that I'm putting a bit more accountability on both the lead officer and the lead portfolio holder for this. Chair, I'm happy to do an update um, that comes back to overview and scrutiny panel, you know, at each point. So once we get to the contract stage, you know, I'm happy to do a short update for you. Yeah, would, would we be able to have that as a recommendation, perhaps? So then at least if, if, I'm, if I'm voting to say I'm happy with, you know, uh, it going forward, just to, to know that there's further um, staging posts in there of accountability and openness, that's... How about the committee uh, notes that this will come back to committee um, throughout the process? Are you happy with that? Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, no, fine. It just means we, we potentially drag Councillor Johnson back here again. I know he likes coming to this committee, so it's more, it's more state staging posts for him to come back, so I'll be happy with that. Yes, yeah, so... Um, uh, 
Yes, Councillor. Uh, can we just, if I've, I've made a note of that recommendation, um, can just someone second it, or that's what you're going to, yeah. Other than that, that's, that, that was my main question. In, in terms of um, Sarah Williams herself, just thank you very much for the report and um, I look forward to hearing how the project progresses. So just clarifying that further recommendation is that the committee notes um, that this will come, it will come back to committee throughout the process. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, along with all this planning, do you have any provisions to deal with the transport? Because extra school is going to bring a hell of a lot of extra traffic. So do you work with like employing more civil um, officers, traffic wardens, or, you know, the schools have no control over the traffic outside their school. And obviously you can't control the parents, but it is absolutely, I mean, I live in Woodside, so I have treetops and wood and Woodside either end. It is heinous. It is just an accident waiting to happen. And every school's in the same position. It, no one is unique. We've got two, two teachers in this office at the moment. Um, so it's obviously, yes, we need some more school places, but if we're not going to protect the children going to school, we're not actually helping. We're just creating problems. So I, I have a concern that is there no way of... I mean, I asked as a governor, could we put barriers outside? Could we put bollards on our corners? And we were told, no. You can't do anything. So how do you protect your children getting into school when the parents have to drop them four millimetres from the school gate? Yeah, there's not enough traffic wardens. And, and to be honest, the traffic wardens are lovely, but they high-five the kids. They don't stop parents. So how do we, you know, I'm not saying this isn't a, a, a sole problem, but how do we make it, we've, we've got to have more places, we've got to have more bigger schools, we've got to have all this stuff. But at the end of the day, we need to have safety as well. And how do we do that? So is there, is there a conjunction going on or is it just this is going to happen and, and end of story? That was my question. Oh, I'll take that. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, when we're expanding schools or doing bulge classes, we will put in planning applications. So highways will comment on those and they will look at um, places and parking within the school. You know, we do work with schools. It's not something that we can stop parents parking outside the school you, you know it's 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 one of those things unfortunately um and i know that schools have got travel plans so they do work with the pupils and they do work with the parents to look at different modes of transport and look at you know encouraging sustainable travel so encourage them to walk and cycle and things but it it's one of them things that's out of our control unfortunately all we can do is continue to look at it but any any wherever we are putting additional places in we will consult with planning and pl the planning application will go in and highways will look at the traffic management. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, does any other member wish to speak? Uh, no, we will we'll go to the recommendations found on page 51. As we pointed out, we can we just uh, agree recommendation 1.1 and then I'd ask Rhiannon again to read out uh, th the other recommendation and we'll t just agree to those two. So 1.1 is that the Children's uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee consider and recommend the following uh, decisions to Cabinet. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, Rhiannon, can you, just for the purpose of um, a proper way, yep, could you... So the additional recommendation is that the committee notes that this will come back to committee throughout the process. All in agreement? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we move on to uh, agenda item 10, items raised by Thurrock Local Safeguarding uh, Children Partnership. That can be pa found on page 83 of the agenda. And could I ask Priscilla Bruce Annan to uh, introduce the report, please? Chair, I do believe that the independent chair and scrutiny is going to introduce this report. Sorry, so who is Chris? So Jenny oh, Coles, sorry. she's on uh, the call. Thank you. Hi there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Priscilla. So this is the annual report for 21-22. 
safeguarding partnerships have a duty through government guidance to do an annual report and submit that to the National Safeguarding Panel. We are aware this is the 21-22 report and has come rather late to the committee and particularly as you've had regular updates on our work over the last year. However, what this report does do is hopefully give you a really good detailed um, summary of the work that goes on with the partnership with the different subgroups, including, including the learning practice review group, our audit group, our neglect group and our practice standards group, and also the related work around missing children, um, early health and brighter futures, and the youth offending, looking at young people in the youth crime system, looked after children and care leavers and also agencies giving a summary of their work around safeguarding not only our statutory partners with Essex Police, Thurrock CCG now, the Integrated Care Board um, and the work we do across South, South End, Essex and Thurrock. So um, any questions? I have to say that the sound isn't that clear for those of us that are on screen, but Priscilla and Janet are well prepared particularly Priscilla, to pick up any questions. And I can assure the committee, um, as we begin our process for the annual report for 22-23, we will bring this earlier to committee towards the end of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, does any member wish to speak on this report? No. Okay, well, uh, with that, can we... Uh, are there any recommendations? I don't I'm not sure there are. Uh, yes, uh, the recommendations can be found on page 84 that the, committee, that the committee note the LSCP annual report 21 to 22 and work undertaken against the priorities. Agreed? Agreed. Uh, thank you for your presenting the report, Jenny. Thank you. With that, we move, on <coughs> we move on to agenda item 11, uh, which can be found on page 155 to 164. It is the children's transport one year extension to the current framework. And um, uh, it says Michelle, but uh, the last two reports uh, <laughs> have been presented elsewhere, but I'm going to ask uh, Michelle and hope it's right to <laughs> introduce um, the report. Uh, Chair, I'm gonna ask Sarah to present this report. I thought, uh, thought my staff with me tonight, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, as you've said, this is uh, the children's transport. This is for a one-year extension to the current contract and the framework. So, um, what we've had is a four-year framework for the children's transport. So, all the contracts were awarded to operators under that four-year agreement. We are looking um, to extend for one year to allow us some time to think about how we re-procure this contract over a longer period. Um, so for maybe another four years and, it, and it's whether we look at doing another framework agreement or whether we look at a different option. I think some of the things that have arisen, um, probably more so in the last 12 months or so, is around operators um, struggling to recruit drivers, you know, drivers going off and working for different companies. So it's been a real struggle. And, you know, for some of the routes, they haven't been able to deliver those for us, um, which has left us in a difficult position and has, has led to us looking at different ways that we can support um, those eligible families. So I think, you know, by extending the contract for, a, for one year will allow us that time to really look at other authorities, look at what's going on um, across the market, uh, seeing what other, you know, other things that we can do as part of a service review. Um, so that's what we'll look to do. Um, we, you know, if, if, if that's agreed at Cabinet, and it'll be going to Cabinet tomorrow for a decision, then that will allow us to uh, extend the framework, extend the current, all of the current routes, so we've got about 140 routes and that's for, um, we transport over a thousand, just over a thousand children now. So it's quite a lot. You know, some of the other things we do are um, offer travel subsistence. So we, so that's in the form of fuel reimbursements where families are able to, you know, they're eligible, they're assessed as being eligible, 
but they actually are able to take their children to school by means of, you know, using their own car. Sometimes, you know, we're able to look at personal travel budgets where we might find it difficult to, to have an operator to deliver a route for us. So we look at all different types of travel assistance. Um, we also look at travel training where that might be appropriate for post-16s um, students. So there's lots of other things that we look at. Uh, the contract value is around four and a half million per year. Um, there is some dedicated schools grant funding. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's an area that is demand-led. I know we've talked about that as some of, through some of the other reports tonight. It is a very much demand-led service. Um, and we always look at, you know, whichever is the best way that we can support that family, meet our statutory duties, but look at the best possible um, travel assistance that we can provide. Um, so that's what we'll be looking to, to do. Um, and I think, you know, other than sort of covering the areas that we deliver transport for, so that will be our mainstream, SEN um, students, which covers sort of secondary, primary, um, special schools in and out of the borough, and uh, children's transport as well, so for social care. I think there's, there's been quite a lot of things that we've done previously um, in the past 12 months or so, 12 to 18 months under a service transformation. We've recently brought together admissions and transport. So transport was in public, sat in public realm, and it transferred across for children's services. So it now sits within my area, and it means that when we're looking at school admissions and looking at where we're placing children, that actually we consider transport and what the implications might be there. Um, we've got lots of further work to do, lots of things that are coming forward. Um, we'd already reviewed the policy. We've um, looked at the post-16 uh, policy statement, and you know we'll be publishing that around May. And that really is, 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 there's been no change to that, but what we've done is tried to make that more family friendly, easy to read. So it um, sets out information for parents in a much clearer way. We're still looking at travel training and how we can um, embed that better, um, you know, this year going forward for post-16 students, because we recognize that, you know, moving to independence is really key for those young people. So lots and lots of things going on. Um, and I think just in terms of the, the contract and the routes, you know, that's something that we will need to look to start and commence probably around June time, ready for the start of the academic year. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your report. I've already had a hand raised by Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, n new, new sort of topic for me, so, but kind of got obvious question. Um, and we often seem to be in this position where we're extending contracts of just one year. I mean, why is this? Can you just tell me? I mean, th there must be a spreadsheet, you know, timeline in contracts. Um, why wasn't this uh, reviewed last year in time for renewal this year? Uh, thank you, um, Councillor. That was because um, the service had sort of transferred temporarily. Um, so it had come across on a secondment and then during that time, it actually sort of moved across on a permanent basis. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was a, a, what we call a dynamic purchasing system. But we realized and recognized that actually we needed to do more extensive research and we needed to benchmark against other authorities. Um, so we felt that by extending by one year would give us that time to continue with the current contracts that we've got for, for the next academic year whilst we really you know, had enough time to look at all the different options going forward. Thank you, Chair. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kerry. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for this report. Um, I think verbally, I think you said there's about a thousand pupils who receive um, uh, transport. Of those thousand, uh, do each one of them um, have a statutory? right to transport are those that are they a thousand who all receive this as a as a right you know uh, through statutory 
Thank you, Councillor. There are a small number who, you know, the local authority has a, a discretionary um, duty where we can award transport. So, you know, we will look at medical evidence. You know, there are a number of things that we will consider as part of that assessment. And I think, you know, most of, the, you know, all of those children will become eligible, are eligible, have been assessed, have been through that assessment process. The ones that are more discretionary are sometimes around um, temporary accommodation. So it's, it's a, it, you know, it's something that, you know, we will make a discretionary decision on. And I think, you know, Michelle has already talked earlier, you know, we have refused applications. You know, we have really stuck to the policy and been really rigid with the policy in our decision making. You know, we have had some stage two appeals, you know, which um, more than um, probably two or three already so far, which Councillor Johnson has uh, been part of those stage two appeal panels, as well as myself and Michelle. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, with, with the um, two distinct areas being mainstream schools and special schools, do you know sort of roughly percentage-wise how many, what percentage of school transport was offered to children as attending special schools and those attending mainstream? I, I can't give you the percentage, but what I can say is that predominantly most of our transport is for children that have special needs. And thank you. And, and are there any children uh, with special needs who attend mainstream schools because they have a particular, you know, speech and language unit or a particular specialism uh, that, you know? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, we do have children that attend, you know, not just some of our speech and language and, and special, uh, special schools in the borough, but also some of our resource bases. You know, Michelle and, and the team have been working really hard to develop additional resource bases, um, particularly the more recent ones are around autism bases. So yes, you know, those children, you know, they have got education healthcare plans, we will assess them, you know, and yes, we do provide transport. Uh, Councillor Johnson did just want to jump in on that, but then I'll come straight back to you, okay? Sorry, I just wanted to try and you know, say to the committee, it, it, the importance of, of this you know, quite straightforward paper. But it, when you've got what is fundamentally a demand-led service to try and make it fit a policy or try and make a policy fit a demand-led service, it is very, very complicated and difficult. And we really do need that extra time to sit down and make sure we have got it right. I mean, you've asked some really good questions on it and so I've made lots of notes as well. That they're, that they're very helpful. But I just think we need that time to make sure we get it right. Because, you know, over four million pounds, it's an awful lot of money. Mm. So we have to get it right. But as I say, because it's demand-led, adapting it to a policy yeah. is not very easy. Yeah. Absolutely. So in that case, um, Councillor, following on from that point and also from uh, what Councillor Arnold said earlier, is this one-year extension in, in a sense, um, like breathing space for a more permanent kind of solution? Is that basically what we're saying here. That's certainly what I'd call it, officers. I, I'm not sure whether you'd agree with me. I hope you do, but that's certainly what I'd call it, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, questions. They were uh, very informative. Uh, does any other member wish to speak? Uh, no. Uh, so then we turn to the recommendations on page 105. Uh, 1.1, 1 .1, children's overview and scrutiny recommend cabinet agree that the director of children's services in consultation with the education portfolio holder is authorised to extend any transport contract under the current framework which expire in July 2023 for a one year period. Is that agreed? Agreed. I, just to inform committee, I will be going to cabinet tomorrow to present this as a verbal update as well, what we have discussed today. Thank you. Now move to uh, the final item, which is the work program. Uh, well, <laughs> there's, uh, we, there's not really much we can do there, is there, uh, for the last municipal year. But I would like to take this uh, minute to thank everyone who's come to this committee this year uh, for their um, work on this committee. It's been uh, very nice. I, I know that none of the committee members are actually up for election this year, so it'll be nice to see you all back next year. 
um, uh, maybe hopefully on this committee, uh, I want to make note of Councillor Cockshaw and Councillor Panjala, who are both new this year and have certainly come on leaps and bounds during the year in this committee. So um, I would thank all the directors and officers as well for their hard work at this committee. And uh, with that, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you all for coming.